I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to today's moderator, Phil Tong. Phil is the Director of Dairy Science, Education, and Research at ADPI. For those of you who do not know Phil, he has over 35 years of experience in conducting research and development in dairy food science and technology. He was instrumental in establishing and growing Cal Poly's Dairy Products Technical Center and served as a professor and its director for over 15 years. Welcome, Phil. And Phil, before you get started, I'm going to go ahead um, and end this poll. And uh, go ahead and I'm going to share the results with everybody if you want to go ahead and jump in. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Beth. It's uh, my pleasure to serve as moderator for today's webinar on sampling and testing of dairy ingredients. You know, I'm sure most of you cannot listen to the news today without hearing reports about sampling and testing and test results as it relates to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So let's see what you thought about what was most important in getting a COVID-19 test. And so you can see accuracy was very high. 39% of you thought that was the most important. Getting test results in a timely way, 16%. Cost, not a factor. Maybe you all got insurance. Uh, ease and convenience of testing, uh, didn't get any comments there. And many of you did say all the above. So I think we'll all be uh, covering this. Let's see um, uh, how many of these factors are gonna apply for the testing and sampling of dairy ingredients. And today we have two great presenters today to help us to answer that question and much more. Uh, our speakers today are uh, Dino, Dino Holmquist and uh, Brett Roller. Uh, Dino serves as Vice President of Business Development of Eurofin's EQCI, which serves to the uh, U.S. Uh, dairy market. Before joining Eurofin's in the U.S. a year ago, Dino has been with Eurofin's in Denmark and where he was working in the dairy industry in Europe and China for more than seven years. Brett uh, Roller is Director of National Accounts at Qualitrue Sampling Systems. And Brett holds degrees in biology and microbiology with uh, emphasis. Uh, in his role as Director of National Accounts, Brett is uh, frequently asked to speak at association and state regulatory uh, shows. Having visited hundreds of farms and processing plants in the dairy and food and beverage markets, but as a subject matter expert, in the sampling uh, to test the supply chain, which companies use to make business decisions. So now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Brett uh, to start today's web webinar. Welcome, Brett. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to all the members of ADPI. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak to all of you. Today, we're gonna be talking about the sampling chain and its industry impacts. and somebody needs to release control. Go ahead, Brett, it's waiting for you. If you just go ahead and uh, move your mouse. There you go, you have control. So today we're gonna be discussing the three major topics of the quality system, the sample, and overall best practices for sampling. And to begin with, I'd like to take a moment and have fun with the lag because I put graphics into my PowerPoint presentation. So let's just talk about the overall chain as we see it from the sample to revenue bottom line decision. Ultimately, sampling is just a small part of the process, but it has direct impact on your overall bottom line. The sample is taken. It is sent to a laboratory. The results from the laboratory are then forwarded onto the quality control department. The quality control department then reports up the results to the operations team, the plant, the plant uh, manager and all everybody. Logistics is then notified whether or not they're gonna be taking product out. Marketing and advertising are notified of what the new materials are that are being produced and ultimately executive decisions are made off of that. If your sample is a good one, aseptically taken, run through a certified lab, quality control releases the product, operations continues all the way through and this line just keeps running in a nice smooth pattern. But the question that I have is what, are the, what happens if the sample 
was taken and it was a bad sample. And not for any other reason than just how the sample was taken. Well, the laboratory analyzed it and a certified laboratory like Eurofins is gonna tell you exactly what was in that sample, regardless of, it doesn't, dis it doesn't distinguish between how the sample was taken, it just tells you what's in that vial. Quality control then has, let's just say a pathogen hit, they immediately notify operations who shuts down production, logistics can get stalled, suddenly marketing might have to go into spin mode to figure out, is this a recall situation? Is this, do we need, is this an internal recall? What, what, is the, what are the downstream decisions that they have to deal with in terms of messaging? And ultimately the executive decisions that what's going on with that plant, what's going on with this product, what's going on, it's an endless kind of stream of downstream decisions that are impacted. So today we're gonna to really talk about aseptic sampling and the overall value added of having a system approach to aseptic sampling is proactive control of your process. So down on the bottom there, and we're gonna speak specifically about dairy, a truck is unloaded, it is put into a, a raw silo, it runs through a separator, a homogenizer, gets pasteurized, it might move down, depending on this is a cultured product, so it then goes to pasteurized finish. It might go to a chiller down the way. With a proactive control of your process and a system approach to it, you can lower and get have a better feel and control over your risk management. You will have a better opportunity to mitigate the risks across the board. So in raw receiving and material handling, that's one through three. Process controls and verification, as a part of all of our FISMA plans, we have to continually verify that our product is safe along the chain. And one through 10 is just a system hygiene approach. Throughout each of these locations, you are looking for different things, but you are hanging your hat on the sample that is taken at these locations. And if you're using a tool that doesn't, that is prone to human error or prone to contamination, you can get gummed up along the works. The impacts obviously could be anything from just loss of production to a full-blown recall. The FDA has, the FDA in 2018 had 1900 recalls of which 382 were food. And reports have come out that the average direct costs in a recall situation is $10 million. That's just kind of the, that's just the average baseline. But then there's also associated costs that we have to consider, like the cost of lost product and brand reputation. And in some cases, small companies don't have the cash flow to deal with having to replace lost lots or having to deal with future lost revenue. And then there's some other ancillary issues like federal fines. Bluebell just agreed to a $19 million fine over its 2015 ice cream. Processors need tools for proactive control. So it all starts with a written food safety plan. We all have them, we all use them, but this really is the foundation of the entire process. A food safety plan with validated processes in raw product, products in process, kill step verification like your pasteurizers, final product lot verifications at the filler, and a lot of people take for granted incoming water before and after the RO and UV, and the final rinse even on their CIP. The key to, the key to avoiding a recall or losing a lot all starts with a working quality system and a validated and continually verified system. So this is what the chain should look like, right? A aseptic sample is taken at a location. It moves to a laboratory that is ISO certified, A2LA, ISO 17025, or at least using ISO approved SOPs for testing for internal, which ultimately leaves, leads to a, a lessening of lost lots, let's just say increased profitability, increased margins, better overall control of your process. But what we find is that sometimes the chain kind of looks like this. Inadequate tools like petcocks or dippers are used. They're sent to laboratories who are not using ISO approved methodologies. So the analysis is a little sketchy 
and that will lead to a decrease in lots that go to market. That can lead to an increase of lost lots internally, lower overall profitability for the company as a whole. So in the dairy industry, we have, they either say you need to take a sterile sample or it needs to be, you need to use a sanitized vessel or tool. And I kind of want to hit on that for a second because aseptic process versus sanitary process are two different things. Aseptic, and this is, uh, this is the actual definition, free from contamination caused by harmful bacteria, viruses, or other organisms. It's very distinct. It's very down, it's, it's very right there, right? Sanitary processes is related to the conditions that affect hygiene, health, and health hygienic and clean. It's not as cut and dry, but yet we work under the premise that as long as we sanitize our tools or we, uh, we, we sanitize our, our collection vials, that that will be adequate. I would say that there's a clear distinction. And if you're going to make business decisions based on the results of those samples, those business decisions can't be made unless the sample itself is aseptic. So what does this all kind of mean? Well, it all really comes down to risk management. The key to a better risk, to, the key to controlling and to better risk management is a documented quality system, a certified lab like Eurofins, and an aseptic sample that, samples that are representative of the actual product itself. So when we talk about a quality system, we're talking about a HACCP or, HACCP or an SQF system. And within that, within the framework of that quality system, you're taking samples and you're documenting the time, location, and giving it a unique numeric identification so that it can, the track and trace in the event of an issue can work its way back to the actual time and location of where the sample was taken. Sample temperature controls are put, need to be put in place. If, depending on how long the sample will be in the ambient environment before it gets to the lab that needs to be controlled. Sample security and integrity controls. Is the sample tampered with? Can it be tampered with? an ISO certified lab, at least 17025 or an A2LA level lab, or at a bare minimum for internal use, you wanna make sure that your internal labs are using AOAC approved SOPs and methodologies for analysis. And the sample itself needs to be aseptic and representative. Because the question that you're always asking yourself is am I sampling the sampler or am I sampling the product? And that, if you don't have a firm grasp on that point right there, then you, we need to look at ways to help you improve. So what is representative? I, I'm actually gonna read this definition because I think it's great. A representative sample is a group or set chosen from a larger statistical population or group of factors or instances that adequately replicate the larger group according to whatever characteristic or quality is under study. The whole idea is does a two ounce sample represent a 60,000 pound tanker truck? And then my answer is, is it all depends. It, it is if it's for beta-lactams, beta-lactams are water soluble. So they um, are gonna be through, they're gonna be evenly dispersed throughout all the water segments of that milk. Whereas if you're doing a lot verification, a representative sample, it's a sample pulled over the entire time of the production run. So if you're doing a 12 hour production run, the sample needs to be a continuous pull of everything that went into that run and it needs to be, it needs to have every component. It can't be a snapshot sample, it needs to be a continual pull because bacteria are not homogenous. I mean, they clump up, they stick to butter fat, they do all sorts of funny things. The, prior to working for Qualitry, I worked in a micro lab and we used to say that bacteria are like small children, they're just gonna do whatever they want. So for best practices, what are we trying to accomplish? Like, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to verify our preventative controls and our critical control points. We're trying to verify and validate the process, the process as it's going through each of its steps. We need to be looking for contamination identification. When you're talking about a plant that has 50 miles of stainless steel, trying to get down to where the actual location of the contaminated gasket needs to be more surgical than it need than it is just a broad scope maintenance effort five days off of production etc. We need to be proving what we do 
saying what we do, proving what we do. We need to actually be able to verify that we in our quality system, we wrote that we're gonna do X and here's our sampling time, here's where, how and why we're sampling to verify that we're doing this. So for process controls, along that same vein, we're looking to make sure that our equipment meets specifications and is working properly. We want to make sure that we're gaining better control over high value production lines and sanitation controls. A lot of our customers use our system for the CIP system and they do a final rinse check to make sure that the final rinse is free of bacteria. It's a great way to validate that your system, that your sanitation systems are in place. System-wide sampling plans for ease of use. Right now I've been in, I've been in a number of plants and in these plants, there's petcocks, dippers, and maybe a couple of you know, this or that. And what I've found is that the plants are the most successful in mitigating risk is using a system that is universal throughout the entire plant. Filter verifications and process optimization. You wanna make sure that if you're paying X amount of money per ceramic filter that it's working the way it's supposed to because you're ROI on that is gonna be based on it's how it works. And what you're looking to do is you're looking to compare variances in micro buildup and biofilms by location. If you're looking at a system approach to sampling and you see back per that schematic that was up a little bit earlier, when I was at number three, I had no buildup, but at number four, it just steadily creeps up throughout a process run. You wanna be able to aware and you wanna be able to see that. And of course, comparing component values. If your, need, if your matrix needs to be at a specific butterfat and a specific protein throughout the entirety of the process, as you're adding or pulling, you need to be able to make sure that you're, you're staying on top of that. So I'm gonna take a moment just to really discuss aseptic sampling as a whole and best sample handling. It might be intuitive, but it's something that I think that everybody we should just cover to make sure, because the lab analysis is only as good as the sample as it receives. Eurofins is an incredible lab, um, and they're gonna tell you exactly what's in that vial, but they are not gonna distinguish between how, what, how the matrix got into that vial. So aseptic technique needs to be used at all times. Personal protective gear, including gloves, hair nets, lab coats, um, shoe, specific shoes for the location, needs to need to be addressed and you need to have a plan in place for a like a hygiene plan like a chips plan to go ahead and make sure that everybody is not only following aseptic technique when they're taking their samples but they're also wearing appropriate protective gear to protect themselves and protect the product all aseptic protocols need to be used including making sure that your tools are as close to sterile as humanly possible and temperature controls need to be mandated throughout the entirety of the process. I've been in a number of plants where they go and they take a sample and it's an hour long walk right back to the lab that they're using internally. So they just stick the samples in their pocket. That's not temp those are not the type of temperature controls that we're looking for. We're looking for ice chests or water baths or port that are portable to keep the sample at the correct temperature for analysis. And all samples must have a unique identifier. Dino and I, and prior to this, presentation we're discussing when we were in labs, we used to get samples that were just labeled one, two, three, or four, and the next week we would get one, two, three, or four. Every one of your samples you need to be able to track back to a specific date, time, and location, and it needs to be logged in a system where it can be tracked back to. Because all of the downstream decisions that the business will ultimately make, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say all, um, the a number of the downstream decisions will hinge on the integrity of that sample. So in conclusion, an aseptic sample is the foundation of a proactive quality system. In the mitigation of risk is always at the forefront of everything we do. And if you are gonna make downstream decisions based off of the results of that sample, you want to make sure that the sample is aseptic and you want to make sure that you can hang your hat on those results. I was recently at an ice cream plant and they, well, I shouldn't say recently, when I could travel back in January, um, I was at an ice cream plant and they were using dippers throughout their process. And I, I asked a simple question, 
what do you do if you spike coliforms or what do you what do you what do you do if you get coliforms and they're like well we dump we just dump that lot and i thought to myself man you're using dippers which are known harborage sites and biofilm contaminators and you're just tossing lots based off the results out of those dippers so i was able to speak to them and give them some uh, some better ways to more surgically isolate what they were looking for and be better tools to make sure that they lost less lots throughout the year. And that's me. Questions? Great, thank you, Brent. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move right into Dino and uh, we'll take Q&A at the end. Please remember you can submit questions at any time through, um, through the chat function or the Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna turn remote control back over to Dino. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, and uh, thank you to ADPI for having me back, I will say. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here and, and, and try to, try to Give something, uh, give something back, and also try to share some of my experience that I've seen in this in this subject as well. So, today, in continuation to what Brad actually um, talked about, I'm going to cover a little bit also what he said and add my points on that, and also tell you a little bit of how we see it from a laboratory perspective. Uh, so, my my today's topics are going to be how to obtain correct laboratory results because. Exactly as Brett said, uh, we can only do it as good as the sample that we get. So I, I'm going to also put a little emphasis on the representative sample, what it means. Um, I'm also going to um, um, give some recommendations on how to do it um, and, and, and also how to actually label it, like Brett told, uh, how to label the the sample and correctly handle the samples, and also how to identify the source of the of the uh, of the sample. Uh, I'm going to emphasize a little bit on the recurring analysis versus an a la carte analysis, uh, which 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 sounds quite appealing, but it might be an, a different situation. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to touch on the adequate analysis requests uh, and what you actually do with the with the analytical results that you get. And that includes also uh, tracing the results and also looking at your historical performance and, um, and continuous improvement. So having a representative sample um, can in theory be rather simple, uh, but what we see like Brad also introduced, it, it can rather be quite uh, difficult uh, and challenging. So if we look at a, if we look at a process, the process say 100,000 gallons a day or throughout a process or in a batch, um, we are not able to test all of the 100,000 gallons, obviously. Uh, so we need to find, like Brett introduced as well, we need to find a sample that re represents these as good as possible. Uh, so when you look at a, 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 a liquid sample, um, we, want to, we want that to be homogenized, uh, and that is mostly up to the uh, up to the sample taker to make sure that it's homogenized. Uh, I mean, in this case, we, we look at different types of stirring uh, and, and depending on the, on the matrix, uh, you, you might also want to have a uniform temperature and so on and so far. Um, you also want to have a look at the sample size. Uh, with a liquid sample, uh, usually less sample is needed. Whereas if you have a solid sample, uh, that can be a, a finished cheese. Uh, you usually want to have a, a finished batch size or a finished uh, unit size. Uh, so if you have a whole cheese wheel, uh, that might someti sometimes be more, uh, more um, uh, correct to actually send in the whole cheese instead of you deciding on what is a representative part of that, even though a, a whole cheese might be considered as a rather homogeneous product. Um, we also want to look at the storage of the, of the sample, uh, the handling and the shipping are equally important. You must always look at what is the uh, result you want to achieve in terms of if we talk about microbiological samples, uh, obviously temperature is rather important, uh, but you also might want to have different other types of analysis such as vitamin analysis where you might have some uh, UV de um, 
UV decomposition of the vitamins in the, in the sample. And there you must have a suitable container that is not prone to uh, allow any UV lightning to go through. Uh, so all of these things you might want to take into consideration in order to, in order to get the most correct way of uh, analysis, a result. Uh, and that's actually something we try to both emphasize at the production facilities, but also in our laboratories, because when we receive a sample, it just looked like anything else. Uh, but that's something we use quite a lot of effort to teach our staff uh, that every single sample is unique and how much actually each and every sample represents in terms of money because at some point it's an investment that the facility have done to actually take the sample and that's another thing i would also like to emphasize is that um, many operators that i speak to they see it as a intervention in their everyday uh, uh, work uh, when they have to take a sample rather i would like to emphasize to them and to everybody else as well that it's rather important to put that as a as a routine that it is actually a really, really important part of, of the whole process, not just producing a, a fluid milk or cheese, but actually doing the sampling as a part of the whole process and not just an, an inconvenience. And the last part I would like to present on this one is you already here also want to make sure what type of um, say, um, statistics you want to apply to this, uh, whether you want a single or a multiple analysis, uh, there are different ways of doing it. You can order even a multiple analysis on the same sample, or even better, to get a better representation of your product, you might want to take two or more samples. Um, very often, whenever I go to a, to a processing facility, I often see just one result, which is unfortunately not a, an average of, of several results. And whenever I ask them why that's the case, I often get the answer that it's because they get two different results and they don't know what to do with it. Um, and then I use a little bit of time to talk about the, the you know, normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution uh, to actually reduce uh, uh, the, the sample variation that you might, or result variation that you might have in a single, in a single point of measurement compared to, to multiple points of measurement. So that's also something you want to consider is actually to have multiple points at a certain time or a certain location, just to have some statistical significance and to reduce your, uh, your variance. Sample origin and labeling. Um, that is, a, um, that is a, a part like Brett also told you, uh, that, is really, really, um, that is really important in order to not just get the results correctly back, but also trace it back to the production. Uh, I've seen several samples of either A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, like Brett told, and, and they kept coming every single week or, or a bi-weekly uh, um, basis. So, um, so what you eventually want to do is, is um, you want to have a meaningful designation and not just to satisfy the lab that is receiving that, but also for the end user, which can sometimes, can sometimes maybe the different person uh, that have actually sampled this, the, the sample uh, and the one that will eventually receive the result. So that's why it, 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 it's rather important. Um, we try to emphasize that it's really important not to rely on memory because well, unfortunately to this day today, there is still some sort of latency or, or, or a waiting period from your sample to you get a result. And if you sample it on Monday and get a result on Thursday or Friday, you might not remember where it was taken. So please do not use a very uh, uh, simple form of marking. Um, I would recommend that one use a, a date, a location, and actually uh, a sampler ID or eventually initials of the one who have actually sampled this because um, if there is any issues or questions, usually people can remember if there have been any issues they've seen with doing the sampling. Um, there's numerous systems of how you can trace that back. I've just taken a screenshot of, of a system that we have, we call Europortal, uh, where you can actually load up a, um, a floor plan of your facility and then you can drag and, 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 and 
assign different locations that you've done the sampling. And in this same place, you also order what type of analysis you want. And as soon as the result is ready, they will pop up here. And we have, a, you know, uh, you can have on, on on all of these locations you can just scroll over with the mouse and see what what it looks like and you get also all the historical performance and that there are numerous uh, ways to do that but this is just a convenient one that that with this we happen to provide um sampling frequency and trending um frequency is um uh, I would like to talk about two ways of, of doing an analysis. Um, one is an already established protocol, like Brett talked about, in order to achieve a, a, a optimal performance. Uh, and this can be both in terms of uh, microbiological uh, um, analysis, but also on chemistry analysis. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the, and the opposite of that is, will be then fire, what I will call firefighting, which means if you have a problem, you need to solve what, what is the issue and, and how do I actually put this fire down? Uh, and usually we look at, we look at, look at microbiological analysis here, but it could also be uh, other types such as, such as chemistry analysis. Um, when we look at firefighting analysis uh, for microbiology, we want to see whether it's something that has emerged recently. Um, and that can only happen by having a continuous improvement program in place uh, because you don't know whether a bacteria is uh, what we usually look at the difference between transient bacteria that is something coming from the outside with raw products or, or, or ingredients that you add to your product or it might also be a, a simple, uh, or it's not simple, but a, a result of a per persistent uh, bacteria in your place. Um, and that is exactly why it's really, really important to have a continuous improvement uh, to identify uh, what is the source of this contamination. Uh, if you look at, and, and we use some of the most uh, advanced molecular uh, biology methods um, such as um, such as meta genomics in order to facilitate to answer whether a, a particular bacteria uh, or a, a microorganism is is uh, is persistent or transient, um, and that's why tracking is is of importance. Also, to put down a basal level to see what do I actually uh, what what can I actually expect from my from my facility. Now I've also showed you a couple from the same uh, Euro portal that we use, a couple of screenshots on how we usually trace these. Um, and, and this can also answer you if whenever you get a result, whether a, a particular result is too high or too low. Uh, that's often the, the most uh, asked question I get is when you get a result and you get it of 120 uh, colony forming units or, or CFUs, uh, is that high or low? Uh, and it all, of course, depends on what type of product you have, how did you take the sample, where was it taken, under which conditions, and so on and so forth. If you already have a basal level, uh, you can easier um, compare that to what you used to have instead of just doing once in a while um, testing. Um, on the bottom, I also have another continuous improvement uh, sh uh, example is that you might start out, when you start out to having a protocol uh, that allows for a higher standard deviation. Now, down in the right bottom co corner, I have, um, I have a residual plot compared to when you look at the reference versus obtained results. Uh, you usually start out with a high uh, standard deviation or a high allowance of standard deviation. And what you can do with continuous improvement is that you can actually lower that by focusing on, um, on, on, on precision and statistics and, and the frequency and the sample frequency. So that's another, another, another good tool that, that one, one could and should use definitely. So this leads us then to the more or less the last point I have is what, then what to do with the result. And uh, a take home message I would, like to, I would like to emphasize really much today is um, never do a test or an analysis unless you know what to do with the results. I frequently see um, that, that people are doing analysis and they get a result and they, to be honest, they don't know what to do with it. 
um, simply put that it could, and it can be that some regulatory bodies have actually told you to do uh, the analysis or, or an, an audit have suggested you to do it, or it might be because you are, you do have an upcoming audit or, 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 a, or a certification or a validation of something that forces you to do this analysis. But you, if you don't have an answer of what actually to use this analysis for, um, you might be better off actually not doing the analysis. Uh, so you must first have a plan for what am I going to do if the result looks like this, or what am I going to do if the results like the result looks like an, another type of answer. And this goes both in terms of a, a, say a chemistry results that will give you different percentages of fat and protein or lactose or, or whey protein concentrate and so on, where you have certain criteria that needs to be within. Well, then then it, that is your part of the of the answer is to be within what we call compliance. Um, the same goes with a bacteria a microbiological analysis um, where you want to be within a certain level or uh, below a, a certain threshold. Uh, or you, it might also be between a yes and no answer uh, where you get, a, say, a positive or a negative to, a, to, to an analysis. Um, so, and I would also like to, in this case, also to, to remember that the analysis is a result of how, a, uh, as, as a picture of how it looked X days back, depending on the turnaround time uh, that the laboratory have together with the transportation and logistics and everything. Uh, we are always trying to improve our turnaround time. So that is as close as possible to the, what we call the technical turnaround time, which is the, the basal minimum it takes to actually do the analysis, which in microbiology uh, can be up to three or four days if it's a, if it's a standard uh, plate growth um, methodology we're using. But that's also why we all, all the time improving our capabilities to, 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 to offer uh, the most say modern and, and, and fastest uh, analytical methods so we can have results as fast as possible and also looking into how do we actually start the result or start the process as soon as the sample is taken which we have in some cases that we have already a reagent uh, that is already present in a, in a sample tube that that will lower our our work in the laboratory but you must remember that the, that the result that you get on a friday and the sample is taken on a monday always reflects how it looked like on monday and that in between these two extremes from sample taking to results uh, you do not wait for the result if you have an issue or if it's a what what i call the firefighting analysis you definitely want to take intermediate results or samples as well uh, then following the analysis result, the result back to the production, um, you must also be clear on how to actually handle the result in your facility to either lower or increase, depending on what you're looking at, uh, what, you, what you want to do. Uh, sometimes you want a batch that is higher or lower in fat or protein. Well, this is the, this is the result that you need to do. And sometimes the, the whole process is stopped because it's waiting for a result. And then, the last point I would like to emphasize today is that your choice of analysis plan uh, should also include a clear action strategy. Uh, with that said, um, sometimes you also do an increased number of samples and analysis without actually having a plan to say reduce it when things look better and increase it when it goes worse in order to facilitate a much clearer decision making. So that was my five minutes, I guess. Um, and uh, I think I will put it all back to you, Phil, and uh, see if there are any interesting questions uh, that our, our viewers have today. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Brett uh, and Dino for those uh, presentations. I know we have some time uh, for some questions and so uh, I'll get right to the questions. Um, I think the first one here is um, uh, for Brett. Uh, Brett, if you want to take this one, uh, and Dino, if you have some to add, please do. But uh, the first question is, um, uh, you had, Brett, you were talking about aseptic uh, sampling and the importance of aseptic sampling. But if it's not for microtesting, for microbiology testing, 
is there still some benefits in in doing an aseptic sampling approach? Yeah, absolutely. And the benefits are actually pretty far reaching. Um, one is just a system approach to your plant from the raw side through the pasteurized side. Um, one SOP, one way to take a sample, one consistent set of tools, the reduction in human error and the reduction in just bad handling can get really get it can really get streamlined. So that's number one. Number two is what if you decide you want to test, test for micro? If you're using one consistent method that has the availability to do physical chem and micro, why wouldn't you stick with that option just from a global efficiency standpoint? Okay, uh, thanks for that, Brett. Um, uh, do you know there's a, uh, a question I know you were talking about kind of this whole firefighting uh, issue in terms of trying to address uh, an issue in a plant, but what, what might you be able to do to ensure a faster turnaround uh, for your micro testing or other testing that you might need as soon as you can? Well, uh, one thing that we are actually uh, looking into is, is, is how do we, how, you know, we look at the whole value chain based on this, but we also look at the, the most uh, advanced uh, types of analysis that are allowed um, uh, us to do some, some, uh, some very, very specific um, um, microbiological analysis that are not the, the, the usual plating, uh, the plating style or plating methodology. Uh, so, so, so we try to we try to obtain that together with the cost efficiency, and and and, and that's what we are um, we are trying to say specialize in. And we also have a, a numerous locations around the country in order to minimize the transportation time, because that that can often be a, a, an issue both in terms of uh, quality of the sample and 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 the uh, and the temperature control, uh, but also the the turnaround time. Yeah. Yeah, because I know, know it becomes very important just to release product in some cases. So the mm -hmm. tips, thanks. Um, for, um, I think this is a question for Brett. Or, um, was a question, uh, try to distinguish uh, between verification and validation. Sure, this is actually a really good one. Um, when you write your food safety plan, the first thing you have to do is validate your process, meaning that you test it for what you expect it to do and validate it that it does that. From then on in, you're, ver you're continually verifying it and you're only as good as your last negative results. So you assume the amount of risk you want and you verify based on your own risk assessment. So if you're doing, if you're, if you're doing raw receiving and you're only testing the raw silo once a day, because you have a year's worth of data that says you don't need to do it more than once, you don't need to test that more than once a day, it means that you're verifying the results. The problem comes into play when you uh, all of a sudden pop a negative, you pop a, po a positive pathogen, right? Well now, everything from that moment on comes to a creeping halt and you have to revalidate the process and continually verify it to make sure that one day is still accurate. Maybe now because of what's going on, you have three hits on pathogens. Now you have to validate it to twice a day and then continually ver you have to validate it to twice a day and then you continually verify it twice a day going forward. Okay, uh, here's another uh, question. I think both of you touched on the idea of, of uh, making sure you have a representative sample and particularly in our large plants today uh, that can be a challenge in terms of our long runs and and large batches so uh, what can you do you know like you mentioned these two and three ounce samples is that really representative or how do we ensure that the sample we're taking is representative of the what we're trying to characterize well uh, why don't we start with you well, good question. I'll, I'll make it short. I'll make it short. Well, uh, to start with, is, is take, uh, a, say, a numerous of samples throughout the production uh, that will give you an idea of the distribution. Uh, and then later on, you might be able to reduce the number of samples if you feel quite confident that your homogenization process is uh, secured. But that's something that, 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 that we, try to, we try to teach our clients as well. And the producers is, is well, start with a no large number of samples and then reduce. Uh, Brett, anything to add to that? 
I kind of think of uh, our representative samples as a kind of an example of a number of integers. If you are taking 60 samples throughout a run, statistically, you probably have a representative samples, but if you use a different method methodology where you can get 6,000 over that same time period, you're gonna much ha have a much higher prevalence of catching whatever you're looking for just based on that. Um, and for me, a representative sample is, that's just part A, but part B is duration and time. I mean, if you're doing one of these big 48 hour long or 36 hour long runs, fluid runs, you need to be able to pull a sample for that entire, through, through the entire, a continuous sample throughout the entirety of that process. Um, not to get all sales pitchy, but we have applications that do just that. And it's gonna be much, you're gonna get a true definition of what representative really is and how it relates back to your business. Okay, thanks. Yeah. This one's a uh, pretty specific, you know, we use a lot of water in our dairy processing plants. And so uh, the question was uh, what precautions for water um, that we're wanting to test for coliform or standard plate count that already has been treated with chlorine. What, what kind of precautions are needed to be taken to have that sample tested? So we do a lot of water testing and what a lot of our what, what, what a lot of people are doing is they take it aseptically before and after the kill step or the chlorination or the UV or the RO system. And in terms of precautions, I, I don't know if I'm 100% understanding it, but I would say make sure that you're checking on the efficacy of your chlorine. Make sure you're verifying the concentration of the actual, that you're getting the, what is it, 400 parts per billion at the end, after, directly after the chlorination. And then also make sure that you're chest testing aseptically before and after. So you have a before and after sample to say, you know what, uh, I had a front load of 1500 CFUs and after chlorination that I verified the concentration, I now have zero. That's what I would, that would be my approach. Okay, uh, this is a question uh, for Dino. Uh, can you explain the difference between qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis for organisms such as coliform or EB, as this can be somewhat confusing for many of the people in the labs. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I, I, I don't, I didn't want to bring, you know, very technical, technical uh, stuff up in this, in this talk. We, we can, we can definitely save that for a later, uh, later session. Uh, but, but, but in general, um, what you're, what you're looking at is, is you want to see whether whether you have a, a specific type of, of uh, microorganisms in your facility, or whether it's you 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 have a general general problem with with which is say unknown. So it's 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 a question about specific specificity of uh, of what 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 you are looking at. Um, so so um, so and what was the uh, the last the last part that you asked about the the CFU uh, no. Sorry. I think sometimes the, the technicians that may be uh, requesting testing on samples are not really sure what to, what to uh, request, I think, for the test. Well, uh, yeah, and, and, and I will say, again, I mean, it, it all depends on, on the situation and, and, and what type of product you have and where in the process that you are testing. So, so it, it, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not able to answer that as in, a, in a general form. It, it all depends on where you do the sampling and, and what type of product you're looking at. Another question for uh, Brett. Um, in regards to sampling, is there any guidance that's provided from a regulatory perspective or is there a need for a regulatory perspective? So any, any suggestions there or comments? Yeah, yeah so that, that's kind of the thing, right? Um, regulatory says you need to take a sample and you need to sample into a sterile or sanitized collection apparatus, whether it be a bag or a vial or whatever, or a, yeah. Um, there's, there, there's a huge difference between sterile and sanitary. So they don't actually mandate aseptic, um, but it, it is, rec it's obviously recommended across the board because uh, of the business reasons and the best, you know, it, it, it's the best kind of sample you can use to actually prove what you're doing. Um, but ultimately, there's actually a lot of leeway in regulatory guidance on to what is considered how you should sample. Um, and I think partly because it's actually just assumed, and but there's not all that much. 
Like there's nothing in the PMO about, I mean, there's a couple of places in the PMO where they talk about specific kinds of sampling like direct load or the, or silo sampling. And there's a couple of locations, but, the, but a lot of it says follow manufacturer's directions. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little vague. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, Dino, I know uh, your fence is uh, active in lots of new methods and new method development. And I was wondering uh, if there's, uh, if you can shed some light on any anything new coming, you know, outside of the classical and, and micro analysis, are there some upcoming testing methods that might be offered to the, that could be valuable to the industry that might be available in the near future or, or now? Yeah, so something something we see more and more being offered to the so when we when we look at analysis, usually most of the analysis are done uh, or, or the very much research are done at the research institutions such as, such as universities and so on. And these methods are usually not uh, available to the general public, at least not on a larger scale like we do. So something I've seen coming more and more up on the microbiological part is is the uh, the use of, of molecular biology tools on microbiology samples uh, such as whole genome sequencing which is now becoming more and more uh, lower in price and that gives it a, a whole new way to actually look at a sample from 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 a uh, microbiological point of view where you can actually sequence and see what type of family and genus these um, these uh, microbes come from. And uh, I actually read a paper uh, recently on, on an ice cream recall that happened a couple of years ago. And it actually looked at, looked at the whole genome sequencing uh, of these microorganisms. And they actually looked at the same bacteria were in the same facility 10 years earlier. Uh, and it was just sitting and waiting for the, say the most optimal condition to actually flourish again. Uh, they actually never were able to get rid of it. So, so, so that's a that's a very very interesting part where we are where we're going to look at how do you actually look at bacteria, uh, also where that is that are not causing problems right here right now, but might actually uh, do it on a later stage, and and also something called uh, metabiosis, where you actually have one type of bacteria that creates a favorable conditions for another type of bacteria which were not actually uh, in a high number at the first place. So these are, these are some new methods that are coming up. On the chemistry part of, of, of that, uh, we are looking into, not just looking into butter fat and proteins, but maybe looking into the single fatty acid composition of the butter fat, and also some, uh, some proteins or peptides that are present in milk uh, are coming up of great importance, uh, such as bioactive compounds, for instance. Okay, very good. Yeah. That I think that'll be uh, useful as we move forward. Um, there's a, a question here uh, about, uh, I know you mentioned the importance of getting a homogeneous sample, but on products that are not very homogeneous, say something like uh, mozzarella cheese or something like that, um, do you just take multiple samples or uh, do you make multiple analysis for the same parameter? What's, what's your suggestion on handling of uh, samples that are not homogeneous? My suggestion is, is don't look at just the finished good. Um, when you're looking at a big old chunk of mozzarella, which by the way, I think I need lunch. Um, the, you need to, you need to finish, you need to do random samples on within that actual production of that mozzarella, right? But if you're also not looking at the raw side process monitoring, you're also not looking at each step and doing a verification sample at each of the steps through each of those production runs, you're kind of running in blind. I mean, instead of being able to catch something early and possibly stop production and save valuable processing time, instead you're busy dumping a hundred thousand dollars worth of beautiful mozzarella, you know, so that's my, that's my opinion on that. But yeah, when it gets, when it gets solid, you're looking at random sampling within the scope of how much mozzarella you're making, you know, you know anything to add there? Well, I, I totally agree. I, I will though say that, that that mozzarella is not the worst uh, in terms of making it homogeneous. I will say some some of the mold cheeses can be can be a little bit tricky because they can have different amounts of molds that you know because. Well, to be honest, looking at milk as a raw product, it's it's maybe the most optimal. 
uh, medium where bacteria can grow and other microorganisms. So, so, and, and they grow exponentially, which means just a single degree difference will meet a tremendous amount of extra uh, colonies in a certain product. So, 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 um, so looking at that, I totally agree with Brad, you know, number of samples, but also starting out large and then narrowing down when you have more control of the process. Okay, this is a, a question related to environmental uh, sampling. Um, uh, you have a recommendation as to the most efficient method of taking environmental pathogen swabs, which avoids the risk of cross-contamination. Well, uh, that, that's kind of a double-edged sword, right? I mean, you're using a swab, which is out in the ambient environment. so. Uh, make sure you're using a sterile swab that's soaked in buffered peptone. Use aseptic technique when you're when you're swabbing, and try and, and try and get it done as fat back into the bag as fast as possible. Yeah, and and, and do not uh, do not. Um... Uh, pool the different sampling sites in one place. That's also something I've seen. Uh, people are using one swab for 20 locations, and that's just a risk for great cross contamination. All right. I mean, right. I, I've all, I've also seen that. Okay, that's about all the time we have for questions. Uh, any of the other ones that we didn't get to, hopefully, uh, we'll pass those on to uh, Dino and Brett, and maybe they can answer them offline. Uh, but I want to thank. Uh, uh, Dino uh, from Eurofins and Brett uh, from Qualitrue for uh, giving excellent presentations today. So I uh, really appreciate that and uh, hope you all kind of got some better insights on accuracy, timing, cost, and convenience uh, for sampling and testing that uh, we talked about uh, first thing that, uh, at the start of our webinar. So I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Beth for some final announcements before we close our today's webinar. Beth? Great. Thank you so much, Phil and Dino and Brett, for being with us today. I'd like to take this opportunity to call your attention to the remaining events that ADPI will be hosting in 2020. The 2020 Dairy Purchasing and Risk Management Seminar will be held next week, uh, starting on Tuesday, September 22nd through the 24th. This is a virtual event and it's specifically designed to help dairy industry participants learn the key concepts involved in managing price, risk, and volatility in our dairy commodity markets. And then we have the 22nd Dairy Ingredients Technology Symposium, which is slated for October 12th through the 16th. This is an educational program that focuses on the latest strategic and applied innovations important to dairy ingredients growth and highlights what is on the horizon for future advances in dairy, in dairy ingredients. The Dairy Ingredients Seminar will be held virtually as well on December 8th through the 10th. And we invite you to join the buzz as industry subject matters ex experts discuss what the future holds for the market opportunities and challenges for dairy ingredients. Complete info uh, event information and registration for all three are available at www.adpi.org. And to stay up to date with all ADPI hosted events, webinars, and news, we invite you to connect with us on LinkedIn.